Hello again, my friends. Uh, I want to show you this, which is uh, a first edition of A Diplomat in Japan by Sir Ernest Sato, PC GCMG, published in 1921 uh, by, uh, you can see Sealy Service and Company. Sorry, there it is. Um, and uh, this particular copy I obtained uh, from, well, by via the internet from uh, Asian Rare Books in New York. Um, I think I paid about 10,000 yen for it or something like that. And it's in very good condition. Um, I got it in 1999. And the interesting thing about this copy um, is that it has the name of, oh dear, let's see. Uh, well, it's got my name in 1999, which I wrote underneath. That's when I received it. But who is this person? Um, William somebody something heart london is that 1953 or i don't know and it says u.s ambassador to japan but um i've looked at the list of u.s ambassadors and i can't find a name which is seems to be um fit to that so if anybody can tell me in the comments who this might be i'd be very grateful um anyway it's a classic uh copy um with all these lovely uh, old antique book pages, um, and I'm very fond of it, uh, as you can imagine. Um, so, but I'm not actually going to, there we are, there's the, the, the Shogun and the front title and so on. Um, I'm not actually going to read from this. Uh, you've got the Tokugawa uh, crest on the front as well. Um, I'm going to read from uh, Amazon, the search inside the book facility. So you, you should now be able to see, this is actually <clears throat> Amazon Japan. And it gives you the title there in full of the book, A Diplomat in Japan, the Inner History of the Critical Years in the Evolution of Japan when the ports were opened and the monarchy restored. And this one, this particular edition here, there have been many, many editions, <clears throat> excuse me, and this one is by Stonebridge Classics, uh, published in 2007. I, I have this one. Um, and funnily enough, uh, I'm quoted on the front cover. Uh, let's have a look uh, if we can. Yeah, can, we, can you see this? Um, yeah, yeah. I was quite amazed to see this, but uh, this is a classic and deservedly so. Sato is a distinguished and perceptive observer at all times. Ian Ruxton, co-author, the Diaries and Letters of Sir Ernest Mason Sato. That's the book, the orange book, which I was uh, introducing uh, the last time I did a Sato video. Um, anyway, this is quite a nice design of cover uh, for a paperback, I would say. Um, but I want to read from the Kindle because um, it gives a more classic uh, uh, cover for one thing. This is much more like the cover that I've just shown you, although um, uh, the sort of the subtitle doesn't appear on the on the book itself. Anyway, um, this is the Kindle, which is only 146 yen in Japan. Very, very cheap, but um, I think it's pretty good, pretty accurate version. Um, ah, yes, that seems to be a photograph of the cover that I've just shown you. Yes. So somebody's worked from the first edition, which is always a good sign. Um, and new and recent books. So this is uh, A Diplomat in Japan, and then other books also being published at the time. 1921 by Sealy Service included in Fathers Burma, The Life and Explorations of Frederick Stanley Arnott, In Unknown China, Among the Ebos of Nigeria, Unexplored New Guinea, Modern Whaling and Bear Hunting, Prehistoric Man and His Story, uh, and so on. So, well, in fact, that's it. Um, ten and Shillings and Sixpence. Uh, these are listed as a in a tiny column on one of the pages in the uh, physical book. But anyway, here is the same uh, il illustration of uh, the last shogun, Yoshino Yoshinobu or Keiki. There we are, uh, Tokugawa Yoshinobu Keiki. 
So this I would strongly recommend uh, if you are if you're happy with Kindles and like like them, not don't have a problem with them. This I would strongly recommend for 146 yen. You can't really go wrong. Presumably it's available on Amazon.com and all the others uh, as well. I would hope so. I th I think it probably is. Uh, I don't think I can make this larger. That's unfortunate. But anyway. Um, so yeah, it says. Ernest Sato, right honorable Sir Ernest Sato, GCMG, LLD, DCL. So he's he's been given different uh, letters there. Those are the honorary doctorates of Oxford and Cambridge. LLD is Cambridge and DCL is Oxford. Law doctorates. British minister at Peking, 1900 to 1905. I think that was 1906, was it not? Formerly secretary of the British legation at Tokyo. Well, yes, Japan secretary. Uh, and there we are, London, Sealy Service and Company Limited, Great Russell Street, 1921. Printed in Great Britain by the Dunedin Press Limited, Edinburgh. Hmm, I thought Dunedin was New Zealand only, but there we are. Um, let's see if it says that in the uh, first edition that I have here. Um, yes, I think, it, yes, it does. So whoever's produced this book has been pretty faithful to the original. So let's read the preface by Sir Ernest himself uh, in front of you there. The first portion of this book was written at intervals between 1885 and 1887 during my tenure of the post of Her Majesty's Minister at Bangkok. I had but recently left Japan after a residence extending the two seasons of home leave from September 1862 to the last days of December 1882, and my recollection of what had occurred during any part of those 20 years was still quite fresh. A diary kept almost uninterruptedly from the day I quitted home in November 1861 constituted the foundation, while my memory enabled me to supply additional details. Well, he says almost uninterruptedly, but we have found quite a lot of gaps when we looked at his diary, Robert Morton and I. Um, it had never been my purpose to relate my diplomatic experiences in different parts of the world, which came finally to be spread over a period of altogether 45 years. And I therefore confined myself to one of the most interesting episodes in which I have been concerned. This comprised the series of events that culminated in the restoration of the direct rule of the ancient line of sovereigns of Japan, which had remained in abeyance for over 600 years. Such a change involved the substitution of the comparatively modern city of Yedo under the name of Tokyo for the more ancient Kyoto, which had already become the capital long before Japan was heard of in the Western world. When I departed from Siam in 1887, Siam or Thailand, as we say now, I laid the unfinished manuscript aside and did not look at it again until September 1919 when some of, some of my younger relations to whom I had shown it suggested that it ought to be completed. This second portion is largely a transcript of my journals supplemented from papers drawn up by me, which were included in the confidential print of the time and by letters to my chief, Sir Harry Parks, which have been published elsewhere. Letters to my mother have furnished some particulars that were omitted from the diaries. I think those letters to his mother have been burned. I've never found them anyway. Part of the volume may read like a repetition of a few pages from my friend, the late Lord Reedsdale's memories. He died in 1915, uh, Mitford, A.B. Mitford. For when he was engaged on that work, he borrowed some of my journals of the time we had spent together in Japan, but I have not referred to his volumes while writing my own. Ernest Sato, Ottery St. Mary, January 1921. Note, in pronouncing Japanese words, the consonants are to be taken as in English, the vowels more or less as in Italian. G, except at the beginning of a word when it is hard, represents ng. Okay. And then the, we have the contents. Uh, chapter one, appointment as student interpreter at Yedo. Chapter two, Yokohama Society, official and unofficial. Chapter three, political conditions in Japan. And you'll notice that uh, there's a the blue text means that you can click on that and go straight to that part of the Kindle. 
the ebook, I should say, I suppose. Uh, treaties, chapter four, treaties, anti-foreign spirit, murder of foreigners. Chapter five, Richardson's murder, Japanese studies. Chapter six, uh, official visit to Yedo. Uh, and from this point, uh, the sample uh, it is no longer available, okay? Being a sample, it's only part of the whole thing. And uh, so where the blue text uh, stops, you can no longer get, uh, read it directly from the sample. So chapter seven, demands for reparation, Japanese proposals to close the ports, payment of the indemnity. Chapter eight, bombardment of Kagoshima. Chapter nine, Shimonoseki preliminary measures. Um, I should actually say that as far as I'm aware, and I'll just check it now. Yes, uh, the page numbers given there are actually the page numbers from the first edition. So that's also rather good, I think. Um, chapter 10, Shimonoseki naval operations, page 102 in the first edition. Uh, the subsequent paperbacks have different pagination in many cases, so I'd be careful about that. Chapter 11, Shimonoseki, peace concluded with Choshu. Chapter 12, the murder of Bird and Baldwin. Chapter 13, ratification of the treaties by the Mikado. Chapter 14, Great Fire at Yokohama. Chapter 15, visit to Kagoshima and Uwajima. Kagoshima on Kyushu Island and Uwajima in Shikoku. Um, chapter 16, first visit to Osaka, or Osaka as we say now. Chapter 17, reception of foreign ministers by the tycoon, the shogun, as we, we, we normally say. Uh, chapter 18, overland from Osaka to Yedo, or Edo, which is Tokyo now. Chapter 19, social intercourse with Japanese officials, visit to Niigata, Sado gold mines, and Nanao. Chapter 20, Nanao to Osaka overland. Chapter 21, Osaka and Tokushima. Chapter 22, Tosa and Nagasaki. Chapter 23, downfall of the shogunate. Chapter 24, outbreak of civil war, 1868. Chapter 25, hostilities begun at Yedo and Fushimi. Fushimi south of Kyoto. Chapter 26, the Bizen affair or the Kobe incident. That's the one uh, which first attracted me to, to Ernest Sato, as I explain elsewhere. Uh, chapter 27, first visit to Kyoto. Chapter 28, Harakiri, negotiations for audience of the Mikado at Kyoto. Chapter 29, massacre of French sailors at Sakai, which is a city south of Osaka. Sorry, I, I'm using the modern pronunciation, Osaka. I'm not using a Z. I find it difficult to do that. Chapter 30, Kyoto, audience of the Mikado, the emperor. Uh, the word Mikado is rather out of favor, possibly because of the Gilbert and Sullivan comic opera. I'm not sure. Chapter 31, uh, return to Yedo and presentation of the minister's new credentials at Osaka or Osaka. Chapter 32, miscellaneous incidents, Mito politics. Chapter 33, capture of Wakamatsu and entry of the Mikado into Yedo or Edo. Chapter 34, Enomoto with the runaway Tokugawa ships seizes Yezo, that's Hokkaido. Um, chapter 35, 1869, audience of the Mikado at Edo, Yedo, Tokyo, take your pick. Uh, audience of the emperor at Tokyo, if you will. Chapter 36, last days in Tokyo and departure for home. And then there's a list of illustrations. Again, the pages are given. We've already seen the last of the shoguns in the frontispiece. And then we've got Sato in 1869, 1903, payment of the indemnity for the murder of Richardson, Kagoshima Harbor bombardment, that's a, a map. And the Straits of Shimonoseki is also a map on two pages. Interior of a Japanese battery after the landing of the Allied naval forces. Daimyo of Choshu and his heir, Choshu councillors, group photographed during a visit to Osaka. Niro Gyobu, a Satsuma councillor, and Katsuawa no Kami, uh, who's um, a daimyo of Shikoku.
uh, in fact, it's Katz Kaishu, isn't, isn't it? Uh, just take a look at page 272. Um, where are we? Page 272. Just looking in, in my edition here. Uh, ah, yes. Yes, that I think is Katz Kaishu. Commissioner of the Navy, it says. Yes, Katz Kaishu. Um, definitely. So the design on the cover of this book is the family crest of the Tokugawa shoguns, as I think I already mentioned. Uh, and here we go with uh, a diplomat in Japan, chapter one. And I'm going to pause briefly if I can find a place to pause. Yes. Okay, here we go. Chapter one, appointment as student interpreter at Yedo, 1861. My thoughts were first drawn to Japan by a mere accident. In my 18th year, an elder brother brought home from Moody's Library the interesting account of Lord Elgin's mission to China and Japan by Lawrence Oliphant. <clears throat> and the book having fallen to me in turn, inflamed my imagination with pictures verbal and colored of a country where the sky was always blue, where the sun shone perpetually, and where the whole duty of man seemed to consist in lying on a matted floor with the windows open to the ground towards a miniature rockwork garden in the company of rosy-lipped, black-eyed and attentive damsels. In short, a realized fairyland. But that, that I should ever have a chance of seeing these Isles of the Blessed was beyond my wildest dreams. An account of Commodore Perry's expedition, which had preceded Lord Elgin's mission, came my way shortly afterwards. And though much more sober in its outward appearance and literary style, only served to confirm the previous impression. I thought of nothing else from that time onwards. One day, on entering the library of University College London, where I was then studying, I found lying on the table a notice that three nominations to student interpreterships in China and Japan had been placed at the disposition of the Dean. Here was the chance for which I had been longing. Permission to enter myself for the competition was obtained, not without difficulty, from my parents. And having gained the first place in the public examination, I chose Japan. To China, I never wished or intended to go. My age was sufficient by a few hours to enable me to compete. I was formally appointed in August 1861 and quitted England full of joyful anticipation in November of that year. Yes, he was born on the 30th of uh, June, 1843. And he was his age was sufficient by a few hours right uh, owing to the prevalence of a belief among those who had who then had the direction of our affairs in japan that a knowledge of chinese was a necessary preliminary to the study of japanese my fellow student r a jameson and myself were at first stationed for a few months at peking where we were joined early in 1862 by russell robertson who also belonged to the japan establishment I pass over our sojourn there, which, though not without its own interest, was not long enough for me to gain any useful knowledge of China. But I learnt a few hundred Chinese characters, which were of great help to me afterwards, and I even began the study of Manchu. Uh, Robert Morton, in particular, has done quite a lot of work on Sato in China at this time, um, and transcribed Sato's diary for that period which was published as part of our Sato diaries of 1861 uh, to 69. Uh, our stay at the Chinese capital was suddenly cut short by the arrival of a dispatch from Yedo containing the original text of a note from the Japanese ministers, which it was found no Chinaman could decipher, much less understand. Chinaman is a word which is not used nowadays. Um, it's deemed uh, offensive. So we have to be careful with this. This was decisive of the question whether the shortcut to Japanese lay through the Chinese language. I thought then and still think that though an account acquaintance with Chinese characters may be found useful by the student of Japanese, it is no more indispensable than that of Latin is to a person who wishes to acquire Italian or Spanish. We were consequently bundled off to Japan with the least possible delay. Of the eight students belonging to the China establishment then at Peking, three only are still, 1885, in the service. H.J. Allen, C.T. Gardner, and W.G. Stronach, each of whom attained the rank of consul in 1877. 
They had all passed the examination at the same time as myself. The man who came out second was allowed to resign in 1867, uh, allowed to resign uh, in quotation marks. Three are dead and one, the best man of the whole set, and who oddly enough was last or last but one in the examination list, passed in 1872 into the Chinese Customs Service, in which he now holds one of the highest appointments. So unequal are the results obtained by even limited competitive examination. When the competition was afterwards thrown open to the public, the results became even more uncertain as later experience has shown, at least in Japan and perhaps elsewhere. The great fault of the system is that it takes no account of moral qualities. Whether a candidate has the manners or feelings of a gentleman cannot be ascertained from the way in which he will reproduce a proposition of Euclid or translate a passage from a Greek author. It does, not, it does not test the intellectual powers for a stupid young man who has been properly coached will almost always beat the real student who has not got the right tips. Nowadays, every candidate for a public examination goes to a crammer who trains him in a few months for the contest and enables him to bring forth forced fruit for a moment. Show me a successful examinee and I will show you a well-coached candidate. In the majority of cases, the process disgusts the man who has undergone it and takes away any inclination he may previously have had for study. And without serious study, it is not possible to acquire such languages as Chinese, Siamese, or Japanese. The scheme of examination is no test of the linguistic capabilities of the men and sometimes sends into the service those who can no more speak, learn to speak a foreign language than they can fly. My own success in the examination was due to my having left school more recently than any of the other competitors. While I was at Peking, the whole body of students was invited to dine one evening with the Bishop of Victoria, who was stopping at the legation in the absence of Mr. Bruce, the minister. Uh, the conversation fell upon the effects of Chinese studies on the intellectual powers, and the Bishop inquired of us whether we did not find that the mind was weakened by close application to such a dry, unproductive form of learning. At least his own experience had been to that effect. This was a curious admission to make, but the matter of his conversation certainly corroborated it. I do not think any of us was candid enough to confess to a similar result in his own case. I should like to dwell longer on our life in Peking, the rides in the early morning over the plain on the north of the city, excursions to the ruins of the summer palace, beautiful still in its desolation. Uh, it had been destroyed uh, by the British in the Opium War, I think. Um, the monasteries among the Blue Mountains west of the city, the magnificent temples inside and outside the walls, the dirt and dust of the streets in wet or fine weather, the pink lotus blossoms on the Lake of the Marble Bridge, the beggars with their cry of Kolyen, Kolyen, Shangik Kota. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, the bazaar outside the Qianmen Gate with its attractive shops, the Temple of Heaven, the view of yellow, brown, and green tiled roofs embosomed in trees as one saw them from the city wall, the carts bumping over the stone pavements worn into deep ruts, the strange Eastern life that surrounded a band of boys fresh from school or college on, or their mother's apron strings, and the splendor of the newly restored buildings of the Liang Kung Fu occupied by the British legation, which will never be effaced from my memory, but there is no time. So after listing all that, he just says there's no time to talk about them in more detail. Mr. Afterwards, Sir Frederick Bruce was then our minister there, a tall man of about 50 with a noble forehead and brown eyes, gray beard, whiskers and mustache, altogether a beautiful appearance. The Chinese secretary was Mr. Afterwards, Sir Thomas Wade, a great Chinese scholar to whom we looked up with awe and who was said to be of an irascible temper. A story was told of his visiting the Chinese ministers with the chief and waxing very warm in argument. The president of the Tsungli Yamen, that's the foreign office, the Chinese foreign office, uh, uh, which later changed to Wai Wupu, remarked, but Mr. Wade, I do not observe that Mr. Bruce is so angry. Do you hear that, Mr. Bruce? They say you're not angry. Whereupon Mr. Bruce, with a benevolent smile and with the most good tempered expression in the world replied, Oh, tell them I'm in a deuce of a rage. We, that is to say, Jameson, Robertson and myself, got away early on the morning of August the 6th. 
arriving that evening at Hursi Wu, a town on the way, and reached Tianxin next day. Thence we took a boat to Taku, where we passed some days under the hospitable roof of the vice consul Gibson. He was later on transferred to a post in Formosa, Taiwan, that is, where he got into difficulties with the Chinese officials and called on the commander of a gunboat to bombard the custom house for which he was smartly reprimanded by the foreign office. Shortly afterwards, he died, it was said, of a broken heart. This happened in the days when the so-called gunboat policy was no longer in favor and poor Gibson fell a victim to his excess of zeal. At Shanghai, Jameson left us to start a newspaper on terms which promised him a better future than the consular service could offer. Robertson and I embarked in the steamer Lancefield and started for Japan on September the 2nd. The first land we sighted after leaving the coast of China was Iwo Shima, a volcanic island to the south of Kyushu. And on the 7th, we found ourselves close to Cape Izu in a fog. Luckily, it lifted for a moment and the captain, who was new to the coast, ordered the ship to be put about and we ran down among the islands. Next morning early, we were steaming over the blue waves east of Vries Island, that's V-R-I-E-S, past the serrated wooded range of Nokogiri Yama on our right and the tiny inlet of Uraga to our left and stood across the broad bay towards Yokohama. It was one of those brilliant days that are so characteristic of Japan. And as we made our way up the Bay of Yedo, I thought no scenery in the world could surpass it. Irregular shaped hills covered with dark green trees lined the whole southern coast, and above them rose into the air for 12,000 feet and more the magnificent cone of Fuji, Mount Fuji, with scarcely a patch of snow visible. The noble ranges of Oyama and others bounded the plain on its western side, while by way of contrast, a low-lying sandy coast trended rapidly away on our right and speedily sank below the horizon in the direction of the capital. Curious duck-shaped boats of pure unpainted wood carrying a large four-square sail formed of narrow strips of canvas loosely tacked together crowded the surface of the sparkling waters. Now and then we passed near enough to note the sunburnt copper-colored skins of the fishermen naked with the exception of a white cloth around the loins and sometimes a blue rag tied across the nose so that you could just see his eyes and chin. At last, the white cliffs of Mississippi Bay became closer and more distinct. We rounded Treaty Point and dropped anchor on the outer edge of the shipping. After the lapse of more than a year, I had at last attained my cherished object. And that is the end of chapter one. I think I will... Uh, I think I will uh, stop here. Um, and uh, possibly continue with a fresh video later. Thank you very much for listening and watching if you have been. Goodbye for now.